I don't need to tell you what Discord is, but allow me to do it anyway. It's only the biggest messaging app amongst gamers, geeks, and teens leaking classified military documents, and with such a large community of nerds, you're sure to attract one thing, software developers. And to Discord's credit, for things like bots and apps, they've actually been pretty accommodating, a lot more than some companies I've worked with. <coughs> They provide reasonably complete and accurate documentation, enabling a ton of ways to interact with their backend services. Except for one glaring omission, Discord makes no attempt to help you write a custom client. While cynically you could claim this is because a custom client makes it harder for them to promote things like Nitro subscriptions to you, to be fair, Discord also has a very difficult tightrope to walk. Letting users hook in to extend its functionality in fun and interesting ways is great, but it also opens up the door to people abusing it for nefarious purposes. You don't want to open your inbox every morning to hundreds of messages about penis enlargement, hot singles in your area, or the one cheap trick no doctor will tell you, so Discord has to strike a balance, letting you do whatever you want within reason. This is reflected in their community guidelines. They don't explicitly say you can't write custom clients, they instead focus on reverse engineering and automating your account outside of the Discord app. But to provide a complete experience, a custom client will need to do that, so the end result is they still break the TOS. At least that's my interpretation. Reminder, I am not a lawyer. Despite this, the sheer popularity of Discord along with its nerdy demographic has resulted in several custom clients anyway, taking it to places that its creators never intended, and realistically probably never even imagined. We'll be covering all that and more after a message from our sponsor. If you're in need of a website and don't want to mess around with writing code or having to set up and maintain a server, then Squarespace is one of the easiest ways to do it. They have over a hundred templates to choose from, whether you need a website for an online store, portfolio, business or blog, Squarespace has you covered and will get you up and running in no time. And if you need to make any customizations, their site editor is a breeze to use, so you can really give your website the personal touch it needs. I used Squarespace for my online store and loved just how easy it was to get a great looking result. It integrated immediately with everything that I needed it to and it gave me peace of mind to know that my store was in good hands. So if you want a great looking website with no fuss, head over to squarespace.com slash mattkcbytes to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. But now back to Discord. Despite the TOS restrictions, Discord has more or less taken the same approach to custom clients as Apple has with Hackintoshing. They don't like it, but have ultimately concluded that as long as you're not systematically causing problems for them, a couple of nerds playing around aren't really affecting their bottom line enough to seriously pursue. Of course, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be careful. Some Discord anti-spam measures have affected custom clients in the past, so use them at your own risk. But since these projects have been around for a while and Discord has so far turned a blind eye to them, I think it's safe to show off some of the cool things the community has put together. like. What if you wanted to use Discord on Windows 95? Well, thanks to the efforts of a developer known as iProgram in CPP, you can. Discord Messenger is a custom client that supports not only Windows 95, but also later OSs including 98, XP, 7, and whatever is out right now, as well as a few earlier ones too. It all started with a frankly stunning concept by the artist Mondi Spartan, showing an alternate reality version of Discord if it had existed in 2005, which inspired iProgram and CPP to try actually creating something in that vein. It rapidly progressed from a simple toy Win32 app into a decently functional little client initially targeting just Windows XP. Obviously there were some bumps in the road even here. As terrible as it is to admit, Windows XP was released nearly 25 years ago and has been out of support for over a decade. These geriatric versions of Windows have equally geriatric support for our old friend TLS, the now ubiquitous encryption standard that stops people snooping on your browser traffic. This makes accessing anything on the modern web pretty much impossible, Discord very much included. Fortunately, a lot of extra work clearly wasn't out of the question for this project, so iProgram and CPP got to work backporting the OpenSSL library so he could access modern websites in his app even without native OS level support. Surprisingly, OpenSSL still seems to be largely compatible with Windows XP, so this wasn't actually too difficult. So that gets Whistler working, but obviously the next step was to go further back, and that would prove to be a much bigger challenge. While he made sure early on to avoid Windows APIs that didn't exist in earlier versions of the OS, there was only so much that could be done without sacrificing functionality, and that was before even thinking about the other libraries the app depends on. We've already talked about OpenSSL, but there's a lot more to Discord than just transport security. Major protocols like WebSockets and HTTP, formats like JSON and everybody's favorite WebP. These all had to work, but were all implemented in other external libraries, and you can bet none of them were designed with Windows 9X in mind. You might be thinking, we've already done one library, what's like five more? Well, to add insult to injury, not even Microsoft's C++ ecosystem supports versions of Windows prior to XP Service Pack 2 anymore, so this was going to require some fairly fundamental changes. Firstly, the compiler. MSVC was out, GCC and MinGW was in. 
When written properly, C++ code is fairly portable between compilers, so this proved to be a mostly okay process. There was some missing functionality around threads that had to be rewritten in a way that would work on older versions of Windows, but that wasn't the biggest hurdle. No, the biggest hurdle was the sheer amount of Windows API that was straight up missing on Windows 9X, and solving this required some sophisticated thinking. A common technique when backporting is to create something of an interposer, a piece of code that sits between your app and the operating system, which itself provides whatever functionality may be missing on the target system. A good example is my backport of .NET to Windows 95, where I made a number of DLL files to sit in between .NET and Windows. If Windows 95 had the function I needed, it would get passed along to the OS, but if not, I would re-implement it myself. Sometimes a faithful re-implementation wasn't even necessary, as long as it provided a result that .NET could work with. This technique worked great for me, where the target was specifically Windows 95 and I didn't have the source code, but overall it's pretty hacky. It required manual hex editing of .NET to point to my DLLs instead of Windows's, and my DLLs weren't very smart. They assumed they would only ever run on Windows 95 because that was my only goal. But if you have the source code to everything, like we do here, you can write something a lot more elegant. Rather than having to point to custom DLLs, you can write wrappers in the source code that attempt to load the OS implementation of each system call at runtime and fall back only if necessary. This does incur a very minor performance overhead, but it's nowhere near enough to notice except on the very weakest of PC hardware. Overall, this gives you the best of both worlds. Modern platforms get to use native functions so there's no loss in functionality, and older computers gracefully fall back to something that's more their speed. This eventually got Discord Messenger down to Windows 98, and then Windows 95, and a lot of people would have stopped there, but there was one more step this project could take. One final, massive challenge to overcome. And that was Windows NT 3.1. NT 3.1, not to be confused with Windows 3.1, dates all the way back to 1993 and had many advantages over its DOS-based counterpart even back then. It's fully 32-bit, with real preemptive multitasking, protected memory, multiprocessor support, advanced permissions, and so many more features we take for granted today, making it really forward-thinking for its time. But notably not forward-thinking enough for a project like this to just work, so this is where the real messy backporting begins. No longer can we deal with this at a purely source code level. This has to go deep. To peel back one final layer of this onion, when you compile C slash C++, the resulting binaries, including any libraries you depend on, will require what's known as the C standard library. This library includes all the raw functionality used by the C language. Basic things like allocating memory, printing to the console, working with strings. You know when some program pops up some obnoxious message about missing VC runtime DLL, and then you realize you missed the link next to the download button for the visual C++ redistributable? And then you spend the next five minutes of your life cursing through gritted teeth about the tenth circle of hell you wish to send Bill Gates to for not just bundling this with the operating system? Well, that's the C standard library, but specifically Microsoft's C standard library. Since GCC isn't made by Microsoft, apps compiled with it don't use Microsoft C runtime. Sort of. Back in the Windows 95 days, Microsoft actually did include a C runtime with Windows, but they quickly learned that tying the C runtime to the OS caused a lot of headaches, including, but not limited to, apps unexpectedly breaking between Windows versions and third-party installers breaking Windows entirely by inadvertently replacing the C runtime with an older one. As a result, Microsoft soon spun off the C runtime as a separate entity, and the existing DLL, known as MSVCRT, was frozen in time and absorbed into Windows, as a component that Microsoft made clear shouldn't be used by outside developers anymore. However, as a useful DLL that's been reliably available since Windows 95, outside developers continued using it anyway, much to Microsoft's dismay, including MinGW, which is what Discord Messenger was using to support such a wide variety of Windows versions. And while MSVCRT is positively ancient, even then, it dates from around 1996, a whole three years after NT 3.1 released. Now, three years may not sound like a lot in today's day and age, but with the pace of technology back then, there are at least two, arguably more, major releases of Windows just in that time period. All this is to say the C runtime situation on NT 3.1 is pretty dire. So after briefly considering rewriting the whole runtime from the ground up, iProgram and CPP eventually settled on backboarding the existing DLL from Windows 98 instead. This time, it was the exact same approach as my .NET backboard, doing whatever it took to get that closed source DLL to work when system calls that it expects aren't available. In this case, making a wrapper for kernel32.dll to shim and re-implement the missing functionality, then editing msvcrt to look at the wrapper instead of the original binary. This got the app launching, and after a bit more work to get around the UI controls that were also missing in this version of Windows, this was it. The holy grail, support for every single 32-bit version of Windows. 32 years worth of Windows releases, all capable of interfacing with Discord. 
To be fair, this still may not be super practical on your Pentium 266, but that doesn't make it any less cool. I'd go so far as to call it a feat of engineering. And while I wouldn't call it fully featured, that speaks more to the insanely bloated feature set of modern versions of Discord than to this project. Everything you need for simple text chat is here, including emotes, uploaded images, basic markdown, and even user profiles all fully represented. Even more quality of life features like the Control K quick switcher made the job, faithfully recreated with classic Windows aesthetics. It's not perfect, you may stumble across the occasional bug, but nothing that's a deal breaker. And a lot of the limitations of the client simply come down to, well, limitations of these versions of Windows, which, for example, lacked support for modern Unicode scripts, causing some curious looking text at times. But still, it's an amazing project, and if you want to give it a try, keeping the aforementioned warnings in mind, of course, the website and repository are linked in the description. But what if your style is less grey and boxy and more bright, glassy colours? In that case, AeroChat may be more your thing. Unlike Discord Messenger, AeroChat foregoes platform support and even Discord features, instead aiming to recreate the look, feel, and functionality of Windows Live Messenger. Now, if you're under the age of 30, chances are you're not super familiar with this entry in Microsoft's long line of dead chat platforms, but throughout the 2000s, Windows Live Messenger, or MSN Messenger as it was originally called, was a major player in the world of instant messaging. Depending on where you lived, it may have even been the dominant one. And with that rich history, you might expect this project to be made by someone who used it back in the day, someone trying to revive that nostalgia, you know, the simpler times. And you'd be completely wrong. Developer Null Pointer actually started by making a client that looked and felt a lot like early AIM, but later transitioned to a more Windows Live feel for the aesthetic. The 2009 release sits comfortably in Microsoft's Aero era with bright bold colors, clean simple typography, and that signature glass. And Aero Chat, well, it pretty much nails it. Simply put, it looks gorgeous and works surprisingly well to boot. Just like Windows Live Messenger, it uses separate windows for conversations and your friends slash serverless, a paradigm that we're not really used to anymore, but is actually surprisingly useful. Like, wow, you can actually see multiple conversations at once. What a concept. Those conversation views themselves are equally striking. Back in the day, Windows Live let you specify a scene, a theme for the client, and that theme would be shown to everyone you were talking to. AeroChat manages to implement this in a really unique way. While Discord locks profile banners behind Nitro, AeroChat co-ops the freely available banner color field and assigns certain scenes to certain colors. Remaining colors just used to tint the default look, and if you're into the Aero aesthetic like I am, it really is gorgeous. So how is this look achieved? Well, Windows Live Messenger used a proprietary Microsoft framework called Direct UI, which is an interesting can of worms on its own, being used by everything from the Explorer sidebar in Windows XP to the whole Windows 8 start screen, undergoing many changes and revisions in between. So you might be expecting some kind of reverse engineering effort to decompile and understand these undocumented proprietary formats in this strange obscure framework, but once again, you'd be wrong. According to Nullpointer, the UI was mostly eyeballed. And while some raw image assets got extracted from the messenger executable for stuff like buttons and containers, the rest was just recreated from scratch, which in a way makes it even more impressive how close it is. The project started life as an Electron app, and before you pull out your pitchforks, there were some advantages to that idea, such as potentially straightforward cross-platform support and the developer's personal familiarity with it. That said, once it became clear that it was going to be a nightmare to maintain, it got rewritten in C-sharp and WPF instead. Sadly, this did indeed nullify any cross-platform aspirations the app may have had, but if we're honest, this thing is definitely most at home on Windows anyway. Another upside of the rewrite was voice support, which a lot of custom clients tend to admit because it's a pain in the ass. An awful lot of time was spent understanding and implementing the various encryption methods and handshakes Discord performs under the hood, and re-implementing them in C-sharp, which you might be thinking isn't the best language for real-time audio, but there is also an ongoing side project to rewrite the audio engine in Rust for even better voice support. Unfortunately, Discord recently started implementing a new end-to-end -end encryption layer for voice calls which will break this functionality. Probably for the greater good, but for now it's incredibly cool, and this new encryption could still be implemented at a later date. There's definitely a lack of Discord features overall in its current state. There's no markdown formatting, no emoji picker, you can't add contacts or view some embedded content. I don't think it'd be replacing anyone's primary client right now, and while that might sound like bad news to some, there is a silver lining. What AeroChat does do is implement Windows Live features instead. I've already talked about the scenes, but on top of this, if you're an MSN user, this will probably be ingrained in your memory. 
You also get online offline notifications from your friends list. You can quickly jump to a person or channel directly from the taskbar. So many little features that really embody the character of these older messaging apps. It's a balancing act really. Some Discord features can't be neatly brought into the Windows Live interface, and the same goes for some Windows Live features on top of the Discord API. Neither can ever be supported perfectly, so it's all about compromise. With all that said, one of the things that struck me the most was the sheer size of the community. AeroChat's Discord server has nearly 3,000 members, all sharing an interest in this project and what it's trying to achieve, even now when development has been fairly quiet. And AeroChat's ads, another callback to MSN Messenger, are actually all community submitted rather than being corporate slob. When it comes to both of these clients, it's clear there's a real appetite for alternate visual styles, for something interesting amongst the flat, inoffensive colors of today's software, for UI design with something to say, even if you don't agree with what it's saying. Whatever the apps lack in functionality, they make up for in sheer charm. I think we need more of that, and I'm extremely glad to see it starting to happen. Let me know if you enjoyed this video, or if you end up trying any of these clients for yourself. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye guys.